Hi, my name is Sarah Wright. I'm a physiotherapist from Queensland Children's Hospital in Brisbane, Australia. I'm joined by Joanne Levitt, who's Hi. also a physiotherapist at this hospital. And today we're going to share with you some thoughts regarding the airway clearance techniques used in infants and young children with neurodisability, um, including um, neuromuscular disease. There's been some brilliant work done in the last um, 10, 20 years regarding the physiotherapy management of children, particularly with neuromuscular disease. And um, this particular, these particular references from Michelle Toussaint and Michelle Chatwin have really helped guide practice across the world uh, in the management of children and adults with, with, with these conditions. We're gonna to focus today on children, but also particularly on the peripheral airway clearance strategies that are used in children. And Joe will go through some of those in more detail. Why do these children need respiratory physiotherapy and airway clearance strategies? Well, um, it's to, basically because they haven't got the muscle strength to necessarily be able to take a big breath um, to be able to increase their, 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 their volumes. And that's important for several reasons. One, to be able to clear the secretions, but also to help them cough. One thing that's very important um, from physiotherapy physio perspectives is being able to accelerate airflow out, a bit like a squeeze of the toothpaste, being able to jettison air out, helps expel secretions from, from the lungs. Um, and therefore, any techniques that we do to improve that will aid clearance. Um, if you don't have a good cough, uh, secretions will stagnate and that can cause long-term problems. And this is being shown now because of the amazing work that's been done in medical advances through steroids, non invasive ventilation, et cetera. Some of these children still can't move as much as a child who hasn't got these conditions and therefore can develop um, lung problems and that's where airway clearance strategies come into play. This is why peripheral airway clearance is becoming an even more important component of their management. So when we think about peripheral airway clearance, we are utilising the four stages of airway clearance. We need to get air behind secretions. We need to unstick those secretions. We need to mobilise them to the central airways and to clear them. So with those two uh, areas of proximal airway clearance and peripheral airway clearance, we have different techniques we can utilise. So today, as we said, we're focusing on the peripheral airway clearance techniques. In that toolbox of tools that we can utilise, we've got our manual techniques, we've got positioning, which is a really important tool in modifying ventilation to different areas of the lung. High frequency chest wall oscillation, also sometimes known as best therapy. Intrapulmonary percussive ventilation, IPV, chest wall strapping and sustained expiratory manoeuvres or sometimes known as lung squeeze. So to get air behind secretions, we really want to improve ventilation and because of the muscle weakness or muscle incoordination, these kids can't get adequate air in behind their secretions. So we may use techniques such as air stacking. Uh, this includes lung volume recruitment or bag valve and mask mechanical insufflation, non-invasive ventilation, intrapulmonary percussive ventilation. And these are probably the most uh, common tools that we use in a paediatric setting. You might find in an adult setting that glossopharyngeal breathing or non-invasive intermittent positive pressure ventilation or breathing using a mouthpiece can also be utilized, but just not so commonly seen in a, a paediatric cohort. For lung volume recruitment, uh, we want to uh, talk about how that's quite different from using a bag valve mask. Now in the paediatric setting, we tend to use the bag valve mask. Um, it is basically a resuscitation bag um, that provides, um, the valve basically is uh, ensuring that we're not going to have too high a pressure that's going to cause any barotrauma to the lungs um, and a mask that interfaces with the child's face we usually generally give a single breath and we don't stack those breaths. Uh, perhaps in older children we might, but in the younger child, we just do the single breath using the bag valve mask. It's really important that we have the correct volume for the age and the size of the child. So on this slide, it shows you a few uh, guidelines as to approximate volumes that you'll be utilizing um, based on um, age and size. Air stacking can be used in those older children or adults, and that involves multiple breaths. It may be auto stacking, where the child can take a series of breaths, closing their glottis in between, such as that. Uh, but if there's no glottic control, a lung volume recruitment device is required, and that is a bag with 
a one-way valve that basically limits exhalation, prevents exhalation so that the breaths can be stacked. Once again, we don't tend to use that in the paediatric population. Non-invasive ventilation is a tool we use quite frequently in this cohort. Many of the kids have their own non-invasive ventilation devices for home use at night, um, but if they don't, we will use them in a, an acute setting to help get air behind secretions. We may use this just as a um, single breath. So basically the child is breathing, um, just in their normal breathing pattern, and we may increase the um, inspiratory positive airway pressure so that they're getting a larger size breaths for a period of time during our uh, physiotherapy airway clearance. Um, in a volume cycled machine, we may change the volume on the machine, uh, but a pressure cycled machine will be increasing the pressure. Um, so this sort of equates to those thoracic expansion exercises that would be used in active cycle of breathing technique. Uh, and in this cohort, we're using the non-invasive ventilation to um, increase the volume of breath in these cycles of um, airway clearance. And we'll follow up with a manual assisted cough. Intrapulmonary percussive ventilation is also providing ventilation so that we can get air behind secretions. This device is complex. It requires a lot of education on the part of the, the user, the physiotherapist, and experience in uh, manipulating all the different settings because it does require titration of the parameters to suit the individual child um, and often at different times within their illness. Uh, the good thing about intrapulmonary percussive ventilation is it does provide some PEEP, some positive expiratory um, and expiratory pressure, and it also ventilates as well. Then we move on to unsticking the secretions. So once we've got the air behind, we want to help to unstick those secretions from the airway wall. And we use manual techniques such as percussion and expiratory vibrations. And that would probably be our first line of, um, of the tools that we would utilize to see if they are effective. Um, but often we'll need to then escalate and use other tools such as sustained expiratory maneuvers, such as lung squeeze um, and chest wall strapping high frequency chest wall oscillation using the vest or our IPV that we just talked about. So these techniques, sustained expiratory maneuvers, chest wall strapping and high frequency chest wall oscillation, um, all provide some compression to the chest wall. And by doing this, this physiolo the physiology that occurs is that we're actually modifying the lung volume. And by doing that, we're changing the chest wall shape and increasing the expiratory flow at those lower lung volumes. We can also um, modify the ventilation so that it's biased to the de-recruited lung segments. And we do this through um, the changes that occur using interdependence and the elastic recall of the lungs. It also, by being at these low lung volumes, we're actually, um, through the elastic recoil, we're enhancing the patency of the small airways. And we're also increasing peak cough flows. Sustained expiratory maneuvers use the principles of autogenic drainage. We always um, use it with some form of positive pressure ventilation, um, most often using our non-invasive ventilation, because by changing the level of um, breathing to the lower functional breathing level through that sustained pressure over the chest wall, we don't want to go too far by um, the child's level of ventilation moving down into clo towards closing volume, which could cause some airway collapse. So by providing some positive pressure ventilation or, or airway pressure within the airway, we actually offset that. So we prevent that risk from occurring. But by, as I said, moving that breathing level down to that lower functional breathing level, we're going to change and modify that expiratory airflow at the level of secretions. And as you actually provide compression over the chest wall, generally you'll feel through your palpation, you'll feel the secretions moving. You'll feel that um, fremitus over the chest wall. And then we'll gradually um, release that pressure as we feel those secretions moving and unsticking, and we'll chase those secretions up the airway by changing the volume within the lungs 
and the secretions move proximately. Sometimes where there's unilateral lung pathology, it may be really helpful to redistribute ventilation. And so by compressing the unaffected lung, we're actually improving ventilation to the affected lung. And this occurs through interdependence and the elastic recoil that increases and causes greater radial distension of the small airways in the non-compressed diseased lung. Chest wall strapping uses similar principles. It's bringing that breathing down to that lower functional level, increasing that elastic recoil, reducing pulmonary compliance, increasing expiratory flow rate in the small peripheral airways. And because it also lowers residual and closing volumes, we use that also in conjunction with some positive airway pressure, most often NIV. The next slide will show you how we're going to offset that um, collapse of the airways by using that positive pressure. And that's where we come into the art of restricting without collapsing. The vest or the high frequency chest wall oscillation, we tend to use when we have to escalate airway clearance, when our other techniques just aren't maintaining airway clearance um, or they're just not um, enough um, and they're not providing improvement. So, um, we tend to use this in especially the younger children who respond quite well to it. Uh, we don't use the same settings that we tend to use the vest in um, our chronic suppurative lung diseases like cystic fibrosis, um, but we tend to use um, a different frequency and pressure. We also use a positive pressure support such as NIV because we know that once again by compressing the chest wall, we potentially can move this child down into that closing capacity, closing volume range. So that will offset that. Now, because these airways of um, children with neuromuscular disease are generally not, um, don't have bronchiectasis, although some do, but most of them, when they're in acute illness, they don't, they just have these retained secretions in their peripheries. Um, we will be using um, the range of frequencies that are effective in normal mucociliary clearance and that's around 12 hertz with a range of 10 to 15 and because chest wall compliance is different in this cohort as well we don't use as high a pressures as we do with cf and our pressure of four is usually adequate in these young children with IPV, we're actually using the airflow within the airways to create, and the percussion of the, um, the air, to create an expiratory flow bias, which unsticks the peripheral secretions and helps to mobilize them towards the proximal airway. Um, so we will manipulate pressure, the IE ratio, and the frequency of the oscillations of the airflow to create peaks of pressure, percussion, and to modify the uh, positive um, end expiratory pressure and the expiratory airflow bias to really provide enough ventilation and percussion that will help this child to ventilate well and to also um, move secretions. The settings during an acute illness will need to be modified as the child improves because they may require more ventilation when they're acutely unwell and then less ventilation and ventilatory support when they recover and as they're improving. We tend to use this when a child does require more ventilatory support, and so we escalate towards IPV, and that would be our treatment of choice when a child is requiring more ventilation than um, what they um, are getting at baseline. Because we're providing high frequency ventilation, we can blow off CO2 with this technique. So we really want to take care um, in this population that we monitor their CO2 levels, especially in children who may not be able to vocalise how they're feeling. Uh, we just need to really um, be in tune and, and take care about this factor. So then once we've unsticked unstuck the secretions, we want to mobilise them to the central airway so then we can clear them. And we may use any of these techniques to help move them up the airway to the more central airways. And then once they're central, we want to clear them through a cough. Now, most of these children will not have adequate strength to provide an effective cough without some support. And that support may be getting air behind secretions and a manual assisted cough, or it may require mechanical insufflation and exufflation. 
And then many of these kids find it difficult to expectorate and clear the secretions from their oropharynx or their nasopharynx, so it will require some suctioning. The manual assisted cough requires that large inspiratory breath first. So whether that be through air stacking, lung volume recruitment, a bag valve mask, a mechanical insufflation, non-invasive non ventilation using BiPAP or other techniques. But they need that first and then um, it is most effective then to give the compression of the chest wall when the child is able to cooperate with the, the cough or if we time it with the child's own cough efforts. Uh, depending on their age, we can talk them through it. And so we work as a team and we breath in and cough together. Or if a child is too young to cooperate, then we're going to be really vigilant to time our um, manual assisted coughs with their own spontaneous cough efforts. Lateral chest compression is probably the most frequent one we use in the paediatric cohort because it's usually the most comfortable. Um, the bilateral chest wall is compressed simultaneously with their own cough efforts. Now for some children that might have a scoliosis, um, this can be challenging because their chest wall shape makes it difficult, or they may have chest wall pain, or some children may have um, some osteoporosis. So we may not want to use um, this technique. Um, if their chest wall shape is um, unusual and it's difficult to do the lateral chest compression, or um, if they find that uncomfortable, we may do anterior chest wall compression uh, with both hands above the nipple line over the chest wall. And it's usually a very firm thrust on the chest wall as the child coughs. The abdominal thrust is another technique used for manual assisted cough, but not tended to be used so much in the paediatric um, cohort because it's not always well tolerated by children. And there is that potential risk of upper abdominal injury with that sharp thrust. As I mentioned before, for some children, um, if they do have osteoporosis or penia or chest wall discomfort and pain, um, these techniques may not be possible at all. And so we may then need to escalate to using mechanical insufflation and exsufflation. Or if manual assisted cough is just not adequate in moving the secretions, we may need to escalate to this technique. Insufflation or some form of um, breath in behind is always important for the cough. So if they're using the exsufflation part of the cough assist machine, then we should generally use the mechanical insufflation. This can be one breath, but generally it's a series of breaths. Um, so that actually helps to get an adequate air in behind the secretions and then followed by the negative pressure of the exsufflation. It's best timed with the manual assisted cough as well, except in those kids that can't tolerate the manual assisted cough. And the two together generally work best. It's always really important that after the exsufflation, because of the negative pressure that it's um, a, applied to the airway and um, that the, you know, the air is being extracted from the lungs, that we actually then provide a recovery breath and to re-recruit with insufflation. Here is a list of references that you may find useful um, and you may wish to um, look up 